by far. It's the general theme for these messages that are being presented at this time. And I would like you to say that again with me. Are you ready? One, two, three. Jesus is better by far. And one of the reasons that Jesus is better by far is that we may enjoy our rest in Him. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes, in spite of how young I am, I get tired. I get tired of sin. I get tired of my own temptations. I get tired of the world, its crime, its abuse, its sadness, its losses, its grief. I can honestly say I haven't yet grown tired of my wife. But I can say even more than that, that I've never grown tired of Jesus. And more to the point, He has never grown tired of me. There's a message for us when we grow tired. We may enjoy our rest in Christ. That's the theme of Hebrews chapter 4. Some of you may have seen the Statue of Liberty in New York City. And on the pedestal of that statue, there is a poem written by a lady. And part of the words of that poem say, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It's an echo in my mind of someone who said something very similar and even more powerfully many years before where Jesus, the champion of liberty for the entire world, said, Come to me, all you that are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. Jesus is better by far than any statue of liberty. He is the one who declares freedom for you and for me and for the entire world. And when we are free, we can be free from tiredness. We can be free from the strains and stresses of sin and just life itself. And so in Jesus Christ, better than by far, we find our rest. And so in the book of Hebrews, we have a number of points that are made in chapter 4, which are beautiful, extremely powerful. First of all, God's promise of enjoying His rest still stands. We're not talking about something here that is dull and boring. This is a kind of rest that is enjoyable, that's fun, that brings a great deal of happiness into our lives. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to move that on. Let's go back to the previous one. We'll come to St. Augustine in a moment. We who have believed enjoy that rest. Notice the connection between faith and rest. My favorite acronym for the word faith, F-A-I-T-H, is this one. Forsaking all, I take him. Say that with me. Forsaking all, I take him. That's faith. And when we forsake all others and when we take Christ into our lives, we can have the kind of rest that we really have been looking for all of our lives. And I love verse 9 of Hebrews 4. There remains a what? A Sabbath rest. The word Sabbath, as you know, actually means rest. And there remains a Sabbath rest for those who believe. And that Sabbath rest is not just a day set in time. It is a person, a person who has sanctified a day. Just this morning, I have met two different people, I think, who are unknown, unknown to each other, who are here for the first or second time today because they have been convicted recently about the purpose and the delight and the beauty and the power of the Seventh-day Sabbath. That Seventh-day Sabbath through all of history was a sign of the rest that we may have in Jesus, the Messiah and the Prince of Peace. And through most of those centuries, as you know, of Israelite history, peace and happiness and rest seemed to, seemed to uh, be far away from them. They had war after war, trouble after trouble, 
They were seen they were unable to truly find their rest. But finally, when Jesus came, true rest arrived. And so the writer of Hebrews declares for his readers in the first century, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now we'll let St. Augustine speak. Read this with me too, would you? Ready? Our souls are restless. I can't hear you. Let's start over. Betty, you take the lead so they're not too shy. Our souls are restless, Lord, until they find their rest in Thee. I can tell you, through portions of my life, I sought my rest. I sought my peace. I sought my comfort. I sought my enjoyment in something or someone other than Jesus. Take it from this old guy. It doesn't work. Save your energy for Jesus. Let him be your peace. Let him be your freedom. Let him be your enjoyment. And let him be your rest. There are certain people in my life that I pray for almost every day. People who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And often my prayer is this prayer of St. Augustine, may this person, Lord, be restless until he or she finds rest in you. Where do we find our rest? We've already answered the question. The writer of Hebrews has already answered the question, but it's interesting to me that right here in chapter 4 of Hebrews, when the question is asked, where does this rest come from? The answer is given, it comes through Jesus as our high priest. As you know, a priest does not serve on his own behalf. A priest is in the place of the people. And so when the priest marched into the sanctuary and walked on the Day of Atonement even into the most holy place, the people were in that place priest. The people in reality were marching into the very presence of God through the person of the priest. Whatever the priest did was on behalf of the people. And so the rest that we are talking about here is found not in ourselves. It's not even found in our church. Our rest is found in our priest, in Jesus as our high priest and our deliverer, in Jesus, in Christ. This is a stunning reality that changes everything. And it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to share this particular message here at Papster this morning. When I first sat down to study this enormous subject several years ago, to go through the entire New Testament, trying to understand better than before what it meant to be in Christ, I did quite a considerable amount of study into the Greek word in. It is actually, the Greek word is E-N, N. So I, I sat down and put all my resources around me and went to this book and that book and studied at length to find out what was meant by the Greek word in. And you know what I found? I found to my amazement that the Greek word in means in. <laughs> That's what it means. And in is the most intimate of prepositions. In does not mean alongside, behind, ahead, or under, or over, or under. In means in. It denotes a fixed position of rest. I saw that expression in one of the resources I went to. A fixed position of rest. And that's why this expression in Christ is so beautiful and meaningful for us right here this morning. I like to think of it in a number of different symbols. The symbol, for example, of the dove the morning dove sitting on the nest, you know that under the dove are some eggs, some potential baby doves. How safe they are, how protected they are, how warm they are. 
in the nest. But if they were to leave that nest or fall out of that nest, they would be in serious trouble indeed. I like to think of it as like a spaceman or a space woman in a, in a space suit. What an adventure to be in outer space where you shouldn't be able to live, but you can live because you are in something. You are in a protective suit that provides for you the oxygen and the protection from the elements, from the cold and so on that you need in order to survive. In Christ, there's safety. In Christ, there's spiritual oxygen and warmth. All that we need for our survival in a foreign environment around us. Leave that space suit. Leave that protective environment even for a moment. And we have lost something very important. I like to think of it as a Joey in the pouch. <clears throat> Whenever I see a picture like this, I think of the American tourist who was uh, at one of the animal parks in Australia. Uh, this is a true story from what I've been told. And, and so the, uh, the animal um, lecturer person was talking about the Joey and so on, and Joey this and Joey that, and the American tourist said, excuse me, but how do you know that the mother kangaroo named the baby Joey? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you are all able to laugh and get it. <laughs> Betty, you know what a joey is, don't you? Yes, of course. So some Americans see, do know the truth of these things. But I love the picture of the joey because the joey is alert. The joey is, uh, is um, you know, keen to explore. Uh, the joey is, is moving and active. But the joey is also safe. And the reason the joey is safe is because the joey is in something perfectly designed for it. And that is, of course, the mother kangaroo's pouch. I like also to think of eggs in this regard. You know, eggs are actually very strong. The shell of an egg is very strong. If you, if you push down on an egg end to end, it would take approximately 18 kilograms of pressure before that shell would break. They're actually remarkably resilient. A friend of mine in Colorado, a guy named Ray, when I shared this message there some years ago, came up to me afterward and he said, Ed, I need to tell you a story. He said, when I was a teenager, I was out in Idaho on a uh, horse trip with my father. Uh, we were with some other people and we, we were trekking along and we stopped and we stopped at the edge of a, a big cliff, about a, a cliff that went down about 120 meters. And all of a sudden, one of the horses a purebred, worth a lot of money at the time, freaked out and uh, tumbled over the edge of the cliff. And the person holding the, the range was just barely able to let go in time so that he also wasn't taken over the cliff. And when they climbed down, they saw to their sadness that the horse had died from a, a broken neck. But the horse was carrying some things. The horse was carrying some dynamite, which, praise the Lord, did not go off. But the horse was also carrying a can with eggs in it, eggs packed in sawdust. And when they took off the can and opened it up, expecting to find scrambled eggs in a pre-cooked stage, they found that every egg was safe and intact. There wasn't a single broken egg, even though that horse had tumbled head over heels down a 120 meter cliff. We are safe in something, actually in someone. And even when in our lives we tumble over a cliff thinking we're going to die, we can be safe when we are packed safely in Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember those pictures. In Christ. It's a question of our identity and our security. If I'm not mistaken, we spend much of our lives asking these two questions. Who am I and am I safe? The image comes to my mind of a child in a refugee camp in a war-torn country. A child who has lost both of her parents. A child who, is, who has lost her identity and her security. And has little hope for the future. 
And that's the description of many people in our world today, including right here in Auckland. And the answer is right here. That I find my identity in Christ. When I see myself in Jesus Christ, I know who I am. I am a child of God. I am a lover of Jesus Christ. I am a friend of His. He's taking me on a journey called everlasting life. And He gives me complete protection along the way. It also answers the question of my safety. Am I secure? And the answer comes back from Jesus, yes. I will never leave you or forsake you. I give you eternal life now. Praise the Lord. My identity, your identity, my safety, your safety is secure in Jesus Christ and in him alone. In Christ. The words in Christ or a description of what it means to be in Christ occur about 240 times in the New Testament. We actually have no mention of this idea in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And we have virtually no reference to it even in John, except for this one place. John chapter 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ where he prayed to his Father that all of us may be one. He said, just Father, as you are in me and I am in you, may they be in us. Most often, when you hear a sermon or read a book on this verse, on these verses, you find that immediately the writers or the speakers go to the idea of Christian unity. And that is certainly a valid idea which can be supported from these words. But friends, I would propose to you this morning that the chief idea of what Jesus was trying to get across to us here is far deeper, far more primary than that secondary application. Do you see what Jesus is trying to get across here in his high priestly prayer? Father, you are in me. I am in you. In. And now I'm praying that all of these, my disciples, and all of the people whom they will bring to me, that all together will be in me as I am in you and as you are in me. Friends, this is such a powerful concept that words are absolutely inadequate to explain it. I am at loss after years of study on this most beautiful subject to really describe and express how this works. And so I am asking that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you how this works. And that as a result, more than ever before, you will, from this point on, see yourself not just alongside of Christ, not ahead of Him, not behind Him, certainly not above Him, but in Him. In Him so closely that there is no qualitative distinction between what it means for the Father to be in the Son and the Son in the Father as what it means for you to be in Christ and therefore in His Spirit and in the Father Himself. So you can see there from the screen just a, a little bit earlier, Jesus had expressed to His disciples that there was much, much more that he wanted to get across to them. But there was a whole body of teaching, apparently, that Jesus felt that he could not attempt to reveal to his disciples during his personal ministry on earth. 
He said, if I tried, you couldn't bear it. You already are having troubles with what I've already taught you, which is far more straightforward and simple. But, he said, later on, when I have gone back to heaven, and when I pour out my Holy Spirit on earth, then, then this much more will be revealed to you. And I am convinced, my friends, and I propose to you this morning, that the much more that Jesus held in reserve to reveal to them through the Holy Spirit at a later time was this very mystery of what it means to be in Christ. There was a man named Paul walking down a road to Damascus one day when he was blinded by the light. And in that moment, and in three years that followed, in the Arabian desert, otherwise known as heaven, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ revealed the much more that had been held in reserve. And we are very fortunate this morning because that man who was struck down on the Huhanui Road is right here. His name is Paul. Welcome, Paul. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for gracing us with your presence. Share with us. I know that typically you get a little bit theological so that even I cannot understand it. Sorry. So if you could make this simple, if you could just share in ordinary language with us, your experience, especially in that Arabian desert and in the third heaven, we would love to hear you share that this morning. Thank you, Paul. This good news that I'm teaching, I didn't, I didn't make it up. I didn't get it from a seminar or a textbook. I got it face to face from God during three years, as you said, in the desert. This happened after I was struck by that blinding light on the Damascus Road, as you remember. It was 14 years ago. I was transported into what I call the third heaven, the place where God lives. It was so real that, that, that to this day, I don't know if I, if I was there in my mind or if my body went there also. But in any case, I find myself... I found myself in paradise. There in paradise, God told me things that I can hardly express. The experience was so stunning that God had to give me a disability, which I call the thorn in my flesh, so that I would not be ruined by pride. I admit what I'm trying to describe is mysterious, but bear with me. Here's how it happens. The Spirit of God goes deep into God's mind. Then the Spirit opens up the mind of God to us and says, come on in. You might think it's a stretch, but I can tell you that if you say okay, if you let the Spirit take you where He wants to take you, with the mind of Christ. I call this whole thing the in Christ revelation. You've probably noticed this theme in the letters that I've written. This, this thing that, that, that God taught me, it wasn't known before. Abraham, Moses, David, they knew about justice and, and, and mercy and obedience and hope. They knew that the Hebrew people had a special standing, a unique calling. What they didn't know was that with Messiah, with Jesus, all, all distinctions vanished. All believers everywhere got, go equally into the heart and mind of God. In turn, Messiah Jesus enters deep into ordinary people with His own heart, His mind, and His spirit. If you want, I can put the whole thing in seven simple words. Christ in you, the hope 
of glory. Trusting Jesus, you and I walk hand in hand into the presence of God. With 100% freedom and confidence, the old way of, of banging on heaven's door, hoping for entry, that's gone. The old way of thinking that I have to be specially privileged to get in with God, that's gone too. You don't have to beg God to be with you. You don't have to plead with God to, to be good to you or to, or to solve your problems. In Christ and by His Spirit, God is not only with you, He is in you. Now you can rest completely with all your needs and all your challenges in the perfect environment of God and His love. That love, by the way, is so wide, so long, so high and deep, you can never measure it. I'm praising God for this, aren't you? I'm praising God in the church. I'm praising God in Christ. Glory to God forever and ever. That's what I say. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And thank you, Jesus. Several years ago when I sat down to study this subject in the New Testament, I, I thought, you know, I'm, I, as I read through the New Testament, I'm going to make a list of all the things that are ours in Christ. And I thought that I might end up with a list of maybe 10, 15 things which are mine in Christ. It only took me a few minutes to reach a list of 15, and as I went on and on and on, I was able to compile a list of 90 things, nine zero, 90 things which are ours in Christ. And this week, Leah put out a little movie with a song that expresses this. And we'll watch that now, listen to that now. Prosperity's curse that drowns the mighty oath of Christ that beats the roots of God inside.
here they are. That's half of them on that slide. The other half on this next one. I wish we could take time to look into these further. If any of you would like a copy of these 90, just send me an email. I'd be happy to send these to you. It would be a wonderful idea to take 90 days, about three months, and each day pray over a new one of these that you have in Christ and pray that into your life and into the life of your family. Just in the last couple of moments as we drive this home, seeking the Spirit's help as we do so, it really is a twofold focus, a dual focus. First of all, that I am in Christ. So when Christ was in the carpenter shop working away and hitting his thumb with a hammer, <laughs> tempted to swear, I was there. When Christ was in his baptism and anointed by the Spirit, I was there, you were there. When he was struggling in the wilderness with the most serious of temptations at the very lowest of his time, physically and spiritually, but gaining the victory, you were there. Performing his miracles, the raising of Lazarus, the healing of the woman with the bleeding, whatever the miracle was, I was there, you were there, because we are in Christ, we were in Christ. This is a timeless experience, calming the storm, peace, be still. You were there. I was there, going to the cross and dying the sinner's death so that the life of the righteous could be gained and lived. I was there. You were there on the cross with Jesus, in Jesus. Resurrection. As Paul says, we are resurrected in Christ to new life in Him. Ascension. When He went up into heaven, He took with Him, it says in Ephesians, a host of captives. He took us with Him, in Him. We ascended, and as Paul says, we are now, as a result, seated in heavenly places in Christ. And then the second part. Is Christ in me? When I'm in the grocery store, making my choices, waiting impatiently at the checkout counter, Christ is in me. At home or at work, struggling with issues, worrying about things, or just simply relaxing, Christ is in me. When I am in recreation, I've always loved outdoor type recreation and motorcycling, that kind of thing. I can safely say I've come within an inch of my life more than a dozen times. <laughs> but guess what? Christ was in me, and he stays in me through my recreation today. In my community, when I'm in my community, I'm sometimes afraid to speak. I'm sometimes afraid to act. But Christ is in me, and he gives me the power and the ability in my finances, struggling sometimes, worrying sometimes. Christ is in me. In my crises, Christ is in me. I know that some of you sitting here this morning undoubtedly have very deep crises personally that you are going through. And we're not suggesting that when you're in Christ, some, suddenly there's a puff of air and, and everything becomes hunky-dory. Some of these journeys go for a long time, but as long as they go, Christ goes with you and in you and for you. That journey you take through your crises is not a journey alone. It is a journey in Christ. It makes all the difference in the world. In ministry, Christ is in me. I tremble to share such a mysterious message this morning, but Christ is in me as I do. In suffering and in death, Christ is in me. I am in Christ, number one. Christ is in me. Number two, what more do we need? It is. As the writer of Hebrews has explained to us an opportunity for us to enjoy 
our rest. And not only our rest, but the other 89 things that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is better by far. Amen? Say it with me one more time, would you please? Jesus is better by far. And we give you praise, Lord Jesus, for that. Thank you that all that you did in ministry, in suffering, in endurance, in teaching, in healing, all that you did in dying and in being raised again and in ascending into heaven, all of that was for us. And that when you did all of that, we were in you. And when we do what we do, you are in us. What a joy. What a life-changing realization. And Lord, I'm praying now as we close this service, that as we leave this place, there might be ringing in our hearts and minds this conviction, unshakable, that we are spending the rest of our lives in you and you in us. May that transform us and may that give us power to take this beautiful message to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.